Greetings, Ship Familia. Welcome back to the Latinx Factor Sharpening Your Professional Edge program. I'm Dr. Dora Renault, Senior Director of Academic Programs and Professional Development for Ship National. Tonight is our sixth webinar, How to Be an Effective Team Player, which focuses on strategies to be a stronger team player to add value to your organization and in your life. We actually have two presenters for you all today. Consuelo Cervantes currently serves as the senior HR manager for Intel. She has over 15 years of HR experience managing talent assessment, succession planning, driving culture change, and building leadership teams across industries and geographies. In addition, we have Erica Pereira Cooper, Director of Executive Communications with Intel. Erica brings 15 years of experience. She has had the opportunity to work for some of the world's biggest technology brands, including Microsoft, Sun Microsystems, Dropbox, and Intel. In her current role, Erica drives internal and external communications programs focused on Intel's next phase of growth. So without further ado, I'll pass over the mic to our featured speakers, Erica and Consuelo. Hello, everyone. We're so happy to be here. Um, we will cover the, the following items with you today. First of all, we think it's important that you learn about the different types of teams, roles and responsibilities within a team, what makes up an ideal team player, the importance of building trust in a team, and uh, the other important area on conflict resolution. We will uh, leave some um, time at the end for Q&A, and we will also have some polls throughout. So uh, Dora, can you get us started with our first poll? Sure thing, here we go. And we've launched. So we would like to know when you started working on teams. Um, was this in a middle school, high school, or college? We have about 30% who voted. And it's still going. We have about 60%, 80 percent, 87%, and we'll close the polls, and we'll share the responses. So we have 69% had started in middle school. Wow, seven, almost 70%. That's amazing. You know, I remember starting my teams in college. That was kind of the first um, more organized setting that we needed to deliver results in teams and get ourselves organized. But more and more, because in the workplace, we need to get work done in teams. We are practicing this in high school, in middle school, I'm sure it happens in um, kindergarten now <laughs> and in every environment. So that's why it's so important to um, to gain skills in this in, in these areas. So first we wanted to again reflect on what the types of teams are. Most of us are very comfortable um, working in natural uh, teams. These are often self-directed this is normally day-to-day -day, um, working on ongoing goals and projects. Um, Erica and I, I'm sure, go from meeting to meeting and we rotate right from team to team. I have my HR team, I have my business team, and then I work on different projects. And um, it's important that in, in every team that you are, that you answer all of these questions that we're going to um, suggest to you uh, coming up. 
The other part, uh, the, um, types of teams is the cross-functional teaming. And I've been involved, for example, in large teams when we are bringing in a merger or an acquisition. These teams can be as big as 100 people. So we have people from various expertise and experiences. So we might have someone from finance, from engineering, from marketing, from R&D, and we're all working on a common goal. For instance, bringing in the acquisition is for, ha for ha having them deliver um, and be integrated into the company. And then lastly, virtual teams, right? So both the cross-functional and the natural work teams more and more are virtual. So statistically about 80, almost 80% 80 of knowledge workers will be in a virtual uh, teaming environment. So this is people in different offices, buildings. For example, I am in uh, Santa Clara right now and my colleague Erica is in Oregon. And it's very common that we do this time zones. I have meetings at 6 a.m. often because we want to include our colleagues from Europe and Asia. And in many of these teams, you will have people where English is not their first language. So it's very important that we keep this in mind in our teaming and our interactions with, um, with these teams. So, Erica, now you'll uh, talk a little bit about roles and responsibilities and questions to ask. Thank you, Consuelo. Um, hi, everyone. Super excited to be here. Um, as Consuelo mentioned, we work with so many different teams. Um, my immediate team at Intel is about eight people. But then the team that I'm a part of, it's about 120 people. And then I work with all different teams supporting. I do executive communications, so I support one executive and his business unit. I work with my PR peers who are spread all over different technology areas. So they cover AI, autonomous driving, IoT, cloud. And then we work with people like Consuelo who are at the horizontal teams within Intel. So at any given day, I am a part of a five, six different team meetings with different teams. So talking about roles and responsibilities is really critical because um, you cannot assume anything. You don't work with these people on a regular basis. You come together for projects and then you go away and then you come back again for a different project. Um, and it's usually with different people. So these are some key questions that can guide you through the process. So you really drive clarity and you understand first the bigger context. So let's talk about the team. Do I know and understand the mission of my team or the mission of this team I'm on? Do I know how our team will be measured? Do we know how what success looks like? And once you have that context, then you move into like you, you as an individual member of that team. What is your job on that team? So what role were you assigned? What additional role would you like to play? A lot of times it's not black and white. There's some gray space and um, you can carve out opportunities for you to do different things than you normally do. Um, Consuelo, Dora and I were talking the other day and Consuelo mentioned that it can be a really great opportunity for you to think about your development plan, where you want to go with your career. And then when the opportunities come up, you can raise your hand or you can proactively talk to your manager or the team lead about some of the things you'd like to do to gain additional skills. Um, and then the other question you can ask yourself is, how will I be measured? You know, what am I on the hook to deliver part of this team? And having those things very clearly articulated in your head and being able to also articulate that to the room so everybody understands roles and responsibilities is really critical. And the last piece here is knowing who are your key partners. A lot of times, you, if you're working on a big project with a team, there are a lot of dependencies. Um, your work impacts somebody else's work and maybe you need information from different people. And it's really good to know who are the key people that you need to work with, that you need to meet with, and uh, start building those connections. Great, thank you so much, Erica. So the um, the next um, item that I wanted to share is in the workplace, we use quite a bit um, the work of uh, Patrick Lencioni. When I work with teams, 
um, either um, a key account team. So I work, for example, for the sales teams of um, how Intel sells to Google, to Facebook, to Amazon, and but also larger teams. And we always go through the five dysfunctions of a team and do an assessment of where each team is and where we need to work at. But I, in addition, I found this uh, book on the ideal team player, which I thought was important to share with you. And um, Lencioni mentions three important virtues um, for you to be an ideal team player. First of all, he says that we should be humble. And humble, you know, who likes to work with people who are arrogant, people who take credit for, you know, other people's works? We don't like that. But I think as Latinos, we are naturally very humble and collaborative, and um, we like to, you know, play fair with others. Humble also means being, um, taking response, just be knowing your strengths and being present and showing them, showcasing them. So not being shy. So you have an important um, role to play in that team and not putting yourself above others, but not putting yourself underneath either. So having an equal uh, impact and contribution on the team. Secondly, hungry, you know, again, I think as Latinos, we are very self-motivated. We are proactive. We're willing to do, raise our hand and do more work. Um, so that's something that's very useful and that every, you know, manager and organization wants hungry team players. And then lastly, smart. So smart is not only about knowing your functional area and expertise, but are you smart about people? Do you have the emotional intelligence to understand what's happening um, within the team, the team dynamics, and how to interact and build the relationships within the team? So if you're able to do these three things well, you are going to be sought after as um, I want so and so, I want Jose on my team, I want Maribel on my team, because you come and contribute and add value to, to teams. So I encourage you, you know, as a resource to read more um, on Lencioni. Um, Erica, anything else to add here? I would like to add a story, actually. So um, this happened about say 10 years ago or so. Um, I was uh, interviewing for a new job. I, I was working at Microsoft at the time and I wanted to apply for a different position. And uh, the senior director pulled me aside one day and she said, I wanna help you get ready for this job interview you have. And part of me was puzzled. I'm thinking, why? Um, she was on the Windows team and I was applying for a job in the office team. So I would work with her, but not that much. Um, and then she told me, I've been observing you. Um, you are very talented. You're very smart, but you're very humble. You're too humble, actually. And it can come across sometimes as lack of confidence. And she said, and you do amazing work. So let's practice. And then um, she started pretending that she was the interviewer and asking me questions. And, and as I was answering the questions, sometimes I would say things like, oh, this executive and I did this. And then she would stop me and say, no, he didn't. I know it was all you. So she coached me on how to take credit for my work without looking like you're just tooting your own horn too much. Um, and, and she also told me that I am a humble person, so I don't have to worry ever about coming across as arrogant. So that was such a great lesson learned for me because uh, to Consuelo's point, people want people who are confident, people want people who show up and uh, it's totally okay for you as an individual member of the team to say, here's what I did. We identified this problem. We worked together as a team to do X, Y, and Z. And I was responsible for driving X, Y, and Z. And here's the impact that I had. So I think this is just something for us to get more comfortable with. And um, in the end, I think people really value this type of attitude. Great. So Dora, we'd like to do another poll here. Can you um, ask, the, you know, where, where do you think you need to work on of these three? You still need to develop. You need to be more humble, more hungry, smart. Okay. So the poll has been sent out. 
We're at eight percent. Twenty two percent. We have forty percent. Seventy percent. And we have 80% that have voted. We'll go ahead and close the polls. Mm -hmm. And we have 50% are hungry, 38% smart, and 13% humble. Oh, that's good. <laughs> Great, great. So, yes, absolutely. The, you know, this is something you can add as you talk to your mentors on this is where I need to grow and develop and um, recognize, um, put it in your development plan. Okay. So now we move on to building trust and, and the importance of relation, relationships. And one of the core things is building trust. Yes. Um, so we, as we were putting together this presentation for you guys, we started to think about um, books or tips that we received throughout our careers that really helped us. And this is one that um, I really valued. So I uh, recommend reading this book. It's called The Trusted Advisor. And it's meant more for people who are in the professional services businesses. And you may think, well, I'm an engineer. I'll never be in the professional services. but um, the way to think about it is that you will have internal clients. So your manager is an internal client, your vice president is an internal client. So whether you want it or not, you are in the business of professional services. And I thought that the tips in this book are really, really helpful. So one of the, um, the things that they talk about is how do you build trust and how can you increase your own trust and this is something that as soon as you meet people, these things are already at play. I don't even think that you're thinking, oh, let me pull up the trustworthiness equation here and uh, see how trustworthy this person is. But I think this is something that we naturally do. So um, basically the equation means that credibility and credibility refers to the words that we speak. And you may catch yourself thinking things like, oh, I uh, trust Consuelo because when she talks about HR and talent, talent management because she knows what she's talking about. She is an expert on the subject or she has you know, more than 15 years of experience working on this. And then reliability refers to the actions that we take. And you catch yourself thinking, oh, I trust John because John always delivers his products on time. He's never missed one deadline. Uh, intimacy refers to how safe or secure we feel when it comes to entrusting something to someone. And you catch yourself saying, thinking things like, um, oh, I trust Dora with this information. Uh, she's never um, violated confidentiality. I know she'll always make me look good. She'll never embarrass me. And then the key uh, variable that's under the denominator there is self-orientation and self-orientation means are you focused on yourself or are you focused on the broader good of the team of the person that you're working for of your customer right so the higher your self-orientation in terms of you i'm doing this for me i want to get ahead your trustworthiness will go down. But the more you play as a team, the more you have the other person's um, interests uh, in your mind, the way you behave will be differently. And so that self-orientation number will be smaller and the higher you're, you, you'll be perceived as trustworthy. So keep this in mind. Um, and it's something that you can always, you know, you can dial up the way that you speak so that you can come across more credible. You can dial up being more reliable, like making sure that you meet your deadlines, making sure that if you say you're going to do something, you follow through and you do it. Um, making sure that you always know who you can trust in terms of sharing information. And, um, and then the same with self-orientation, making sure that you self-orient yourself to 
the bigger goal that you have as a team, as a company. Um, so, so that's that in terms of building trust. Um, here is the book. They have a new version out and I recommend it. And then in the next slide, we are going to talk about something here. Uh, Erica, I just wanted to say that, um, you know, for Intel, I can see many parts of the culture pillars in this equation. So Intel, for example, is really focusing on trust and transparency. So credibility goes with that. The more transparent, the more trust you build. We're also focusing on one Intel, right? So that's the self-orientation that you're there for not yourself or your own team, but for the good of the broader organization and Intel and the customers. And then also we have inclusion, which is about intimacy and the importance of building a safe and positive work environment. So many organizations that, and are really built around how can we have a workplace that's all around trust so you can um, perform and everyone else around you can perform to, the, to their highest potential. Yeah, and I think we have a poll, don't we? Don't yes. We have a third poll? Yes. Okay. So which element of the trust equation are you here we go. Are you stronger in? So reliability is um, has to do with your actions. Credibility has to do with the way you speak and how people perceive you as an expert. Intimacy refers to the safety or security that we feel when we trust information to other people and self-orientation is your focus. Are you focused on yourself or are you focused on the broader good, like your customer, your team, your company? Okay, we have 50% that voted. percent they're still coming in we're at 75 and we'll close the polls at 81 percent okay so we have 59% reliability, 24% credibility, 35% intimacy, and 29% self-orientation. Really good. And I feel like if you are just starting out your career, maybe you feel like you don't have as much credibility because you don't have as many years of experience. But the way to build your credibility is to be a reliable, dependable person. And it seems like a lot of you are doing that and feel like that part of um, your strengths. And then it looks like there's a lot of room for improvement in terms of self-orientation. So that's really good. Okay. So going on to the next slide. So now we are going to talk about conflict resolution. And um, here um, we're also providing you with a tip. Um, it's another book. And I was able to take a class focused on crucial conversations about 12 years ago when I was working at Sun Microsystems. And um, this is something that has stayed with me. The beauty of the books that we are recommending for you is that as you um, experience the workplace, as you try these things out, um, some of them just become part of your toolbox. And you will also realize that with time, you look at them differently and you actually can become even better at some of those things. So keep that in mind. Um, but I, I found uh, this book really interesting because it's um, written by professors who focus on um, management and uh, training programs for corporations. And basically, these seven steps that you see there are based on insights um, that they gathered over 25 years of research um, with 20,000 people. And 
they really uh, started to ask themselves as they were doing the research, who are the people who are really good at having those crucial conversations? And what are the things that these people do consistently that help them get through really tough conversations without damaging relationships? And uh, basically what they realized is that um, the people who are able to develop high quality relationships are people who are very successful in life. You tend to have better relationships in your family, in your marriage, at work. And they have this mentality where they create a win-win for everybody. They're not just thinking about themselves. So um, I'll go through some of the key uh, points that they made uh, related to the seven steps. But again, I encourage you to buy the book or there are so many blogs that kind of summarize the book um, on the web and you can read about it and then think about how you can implement this um, when you're having crucial conversations at work, at home, with your friends. Um, the point that they make too is that crucial conversations happen everywhere, whether we want it or not. Sometimes you're just thrown into one. And what makes it a crucial conversation, um, and there are three elements. One, that people have different opinions, emotions are very high, and then there's a lot at stake. Um, so let's dive into it. So the first one is to start with the heart. And basically the main point that they make here is that you need to bring empathy and you need to have a positive intent when you go into those really critical conversations. And uh, it all starts with having an open mind. So going to these meetings, it can be a team meeting, it, you know, sometimes you, you're not expecting to have a crucial conversation. And then in the middle of a project, all of a sudden, there's a big issue. But if you're open minded, and if you have the right mindset, then you're able to listen, you're able to engage, you're able to understand that people have different points of view, and that's okay. And it's okay to debate. Um, and, you know, based on my experience, I've been to many meetings where you can tell there's so much tension. There are people who get into the meeting and they are angry. There are people who are resenting something. You don't know. You just can tell there's some sort of resentment. Or there are people who go into the meeting and they already have their mind made up. There's just one possible solution to this problem. <laughs> and that becomes very hard, right, for you to actually problem solve and keep thinking about, well, we have this end goal over here. How do we get to the end goal? And there are many different approaches to that end goal. So, so this is just for you to remember before you go into a meeting or going to some sort of project, just check your mindset. Um, the second one is to stay in dialogue. So you have to keep talking. You have to keep pulling out relevant information so you understand where the different people are coming from. And in most cases, we all sit in different parts of the organization. So we all have different viewpoints and all of those viewpoints are very important as you're going through a project. Um, the third piece is to make it safe. And uh, when people feel safe around you, they will talk, they will, will express their points of view. And the easiest way to make people feel safe is to listen. So if you can ask questions, if you can you know, openly and respectfully listen to what they're saying. And you have to actually show that you're listening to them. So things like paraphrasing what they said, oh, let me make sure that I understand what you just said. So basically the main issue, you know, is blah, or you are very focused on doing X. Um, then they realize, oh, this person is open. This person is paying attention to what I'm saying. And what happens when you listen to them is that now you, you win them over and then they will listen to you as well. And then you can really have a good dialogue. Um, the fourth step is to not get hooked by emotion or not be the person who hooks them with emotion. And that's because it can be very distracting. Um, and uh, so when that happens, and I used to have a manager in a previous job who was very emotional and he would go to meetings and all of a sudden you're feeling attacked, you know, because he would say, well, you said this or you blah, blah, blah. And you're just like, oh my gosh, I didn't expect to be um, going through the inquisition today in this meeting. So you have to um, refuse to play the game. That is the, the main advice is 
try to step out of it um, and pay attention to what the person is saying without all the emotional charge. And then at the same time, really think about what is the big picture here? You know, what are we trying to accomplish? And um, sometimes by asking questions and getting people to talk, they will calm down. Um, and then you can also restate your intent. You can say, you know, my intent is to help us achieve X, Y, and Z. So how can we do that? Or I, I've noticed that you're, you, you seem angry. I've noticed that there's something that's really bugging you, but how can we achieve X, Y, and Z? And usually that gets people out of that emotional state to start more, you know, talking more about the facts and the steps that you need to take. Uh, the, the fifth uh, step here is to agree on a mutual purpose. And the main word here is mutual. So it's, it's really good for you to ask yourself, you know, why am I here? What do I need to accomplish? And then ask yourself, why is Consuelo here? What does Consuelo need to accomplish? And then create a mutual purpose. So what do we need to accomplish together? And once you have that baseline established, then it becomes much easier to problem solve, to figure out you know, how we're gonna go about solving this problem. The sixth step here is to separate facts from story. So facts are something that, um, you know, they're evidence. It can be something that you saw on a slide. It can be something that you heard from your manager or you heard in a big meeting, or it can be data that you have from research and facts are safe, right? So that's one way to get people to agree on the facts that we are working with. And story is what we use to give meaning to facts. And uh, we're all smart people. So as soon as you hear a fact, you're already you're kind of analyzing that fact and you're creating a story. But um, you can have multiple meanings to the same set of facts. So sometimes you will go really fast from fact to meaning, fact to story. And it's good to kind of like take a step back and just, well, let's just review all the facts together to make sure that we agree on them. And then you can create this greater shared story together that helps you move forward as well. And then the seventh step here is for you to agree on a clear action plan. So once you have built the consensus, then now let's talk about who is going to do what and by when. Um, and uh, I think we can go to the next slide. OK, so the other way to think about um, the seven steps that we just heard is to think about the role that you need to play versus the role that you would like to play. And I put this here because it took me a long time to make peace with this because you go into a meeting and you think this is the role that I'm going to play based on my conversation with my manager. And then you get there and then you realize that actually you need to play a very different role because of people, because of conflicts, because of what's needed. And I think the sooner you can realize this, um, the more successful you're going to be at your job and the more fulfilling your job will be. And um, the way that I try to think about it, you know, I looked at the seven steps and, you know, the first one was like, start with the heart. Well, that's what you do when you're a friend. So sometimes you're going to need to be a friend. You're going to just need to sit there with an open mind, no judgment, and listen to what the other people are saying. Um, sometimes you're going to have to be that therapist, mediator. You're going to, again, have to listen and understand where they're coming from and help different parties make peace in a meeting or come together to want to solve that problem. Um, sometimes you're going to have to be the trusted advisor um, to the people that you're working with. So usually one of the techniques that trusted advisors um, will do is like they ask a lot of questions to understand what uh, success looks like, what is keeping you up at night, what are the things that you would like to do, what is your vision, 
and then they find a way to create a win-win for everybody. Um, other times you're going to have to be the judge, meaning you're going to have to separate facts from story, and then you're going to have to create a shared story together. And other times you're going to have to be the driver. You're going to, to be like, okay, we all agree on X. Now it's time for us to move forward and stop discussing. <laughs> So I hope this helps you, but it has really helped me throughout my career. So I can, I understand. And, and I put this here because like I mentioned earlier, it's not like someone is going to tell you, oh, Erica, I'm going to put you on this team. But, you know, person A doesn't get along with person B. Person C uh, doesn't even know why they were put on that team. And you are going there, but they don't really know what our team does. It's like it doesn't work like that you're thrown into these situations and then you just realize, oh my gosh, this is actually very hard. Uh, no one here seems to be on the same page. And sometimes you have a very hard deadline and you have to go through those things that are about people and conflict resolution to be able to, to get your project done. Um, and then the last thing I was gonna say in terms of um, tips for you. These are some suggested language that you can use um, and I find them very helpful. So the first one there, our goal is to, so that reminds people of why we all come together. Um, there are people who miss meetings, there are people who sometimes are not paying attention to what is being said. So it's good to say, okay, to ground everyone, La, you know, in our last meeting, we decided X, Y, and Z. And in this meeting, we are here today to decide uh, A, B, C. Um, and then that number three, they're like taking a step back. You see that sometimes, you know, people go from facts to story really fast. And sometimes you're like, well, but we haven't agreed on all of the facts or we haven't agreed on what we actually have to deliver. So it's good to say, well, let's take a step back and really look at what was asked of our team. Um, again, let's look at the facts. Let's look at the options. Let's look at the pros and cons of each option. I use um, options and pros and cons a lot because there are many different ways to solve a problem. So sometimes it's really good to kind of put it in paper and look at the pros and cons because that allows you to manage risk and also to understand which approach um, meets expectations better. Um, sometimes there are little nuances that can make a big difference. Um, if you want to be very factual, you can say, I've noticed that, and then you list what you've observed. Um, sometimes just saying, I hear your concerns, just helping people understand that, okay, they've been talking, maybe they mentioned something twice, three times. So just acknowledge that you've heard them. Um, Technique number seven is something that com comes from improv, um, and you must have seen this before, but it's saying yes and. So there are people who will come and they will say, this is the only approach or the only way to solve it. this problem is this. And you, say, you can say, yes, this is one way, and I'd like to uh, propose a different way. And it's just something that helps you bridge so you can you don't have to say well but or no i disagree because the moment you say i disagree you put people in opposite teams so to speak um so that's a really good technique to kind of keep the conversation going and to help people um, move you know along with you um number eight there says i think i see things differently so that gives you an opening to be able to say let's look at a different approach or let's consider this other angle. Um, and then you also need to know when to escalate and when to let it go. Um, sometimes you will have tried, you will have done all you can do, you will have used all the tools that are in your toolbox and you still don't get any sort of resolution. And, and I listed a few things here that have happened to me. So sometimes, um, what you realize when you start working with the teams is that alignment at the top is non-existent. So you all can meet, you can talk about things, but let's say if the, there's no budget. So how are we gonna actually execute on this if we don't know who's gonna pay for what? Um, so sometimes I'll escalate to my manager, give her an update on everything that we've done and how there's alignment that's missing. 
and that I need people at the top to get together and make a decision. Sometimes you have to follow hierarchy. Um, there are companies that the decision is really top down. We call it command style. And sometimes that, that's a good thing because then everybody understands there's the decision that was made and then you just go into execution mode. And then um, there are other situations and I put other with an asterisk there because um, there'll be times where, in a, where you'll be in a team and there are people who don't wanna be there. There are people who were just given that assignment because they were the only ones who had been with, but they have no interest in helping at all. And you just have to let it go. Some of it, you just realize, okay, you're dead weight. We're gonna deal with dead weight over here and we're just gonna keep moving forward. Great, thank you so much. Yeah, I think these are really useful, Eric, especially when teams are stuck right? And they're just talking over the same thing or the same data. And again, I think it's so important to say, okay, what, what is the goal here? What are we here for? Let's try to move forward and make progress. And also the options, right? Sometimes there's no ideal solution, but let's, what are our options? And let's analyze those and move forward. Again, how, what is your role in moving the team and making progress there? I think that's really valuable. So, you know, in, in summary, we've given you a lot to think about, um, about your role in teams, right? And this is something I constantly do. You know, I go to team meetings and some, I'm an observer, I'm a listener. It, it feels like I'm auditing the team. I'm still learning and I still can use the knowledge in other areas. Sometimes I will go and challenge the status quo because there's a lot of things that need change. So you would need to always ask yourself in any team, what, what is my role? What role do I need to play um, to be effective and move the team forward? Um, Dora, can we open it up for questions now? Will they, uh, people be able to ask through the chat box? How do you normally do this? They, they can go ahead and submit questions right now and then I'll just call them out. So okay. our, and the first question is just are the from um let's see Gus Gasso, a big shout out. Thank you, Gus, for the question. It's just are the slides going to be available so that they can review later? And so we're excited to announce that all of our webinars will be housed on ship.org under programs. So just find the Latin Latinx Factor program on the ship.org website. It's recorded as well, right? So people can share it with other team members, other colleagues and yes, members. Definitely. So Ship Familia, feel free to send in any other questions. And there's no wrong question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I I have one for you ladies. Um yeah, absolutely. I, I would like to know if you have any tips to help the participants who want to grow in that area. I know we had 50% that identified as being wanting to grow under the hungry area. Do you have any tips on that? Versus the smart. And, okay. Yeah. Um, so I think like when I think about, so I used to be um, a manager when I was at Jobbox and um, my team had three people and we were expanding and um you know you start to see how your team members and your direct reports differentiate and i think being hungry it's something that can differentiate you right away so i had some direct reports who were always paying attention um like very engaged they ask lots of good questions they let's say if i said something like oh, I need help to think through this um, customer storytelling program. And I would just say something like, what we have right now is not really working. And then they would come to me proactively and say things like, hey, Erica, I heard you say that um, you wanted ideas <clears throat> for how to do customer storytelling better. I did some research or I talked to the marketing team and here are some ideas. And this is just so wonderful because you realize that 
the person is being proactive, they're listening, they're coming to you with ideas, they're solving a problem, and then you naturally start giving them more assignments and you give them stretch projects. Um, I started bringing some of those more junior people to meetings with me so I could shadow, they could shadow me and they could see how we interacted with more senior executives. So uh, this would be like my advice to you, like if you are really engaged, if you like what you're doing, don't ask permission, just like do it, find something, find a way um, in which you can add value and then just keep bringing those ideas, opportunities to, to your manager. Yeah, that's what I would say um, as well, that you need to be involved with projects that you're really passionate about. I think when you like the work, when you like the company, it's, it's going to come natural for you to want more and learn more and contribute. So look for organizations, projects that you have a passion for. And, and then you'll, you'll see that you are more proactive, more engaged, want to learn more. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have a, a question from Juan Lopez. He says, what role do you enjoy performing the most in a team? <laughs> well, I, I mean, I, I think it, it would probably be that the trusted advisor, um, maybe because I, I am in human resources, right? So I um try to be very neutral and not really take sides so it's um and then people ask me a lot of questions on well how you know how is this law interpreted or what would i do in this situation so i i tend to play that in my business role but when i'm in my hr role i like to play more of the challenge the system on how do we improve how do we continuously improve so i would say i see myself playing those two roles depending on the audience i'm with mm -hmm. i'd say i'm definitely um a friend and a driver so i listen a lot just to understand where people are coming from but i like to get things done and i like to do things really well so I'm the person I have to control myself sometimes and remind myself like this is not your meeting. <laughs> you know, but I um especially like Consuelo said, if you're passionate, if you like what you're doing, it's it's just I just like to get in there and then come up with a plan and very collaborative. That's why I said I'm a friend. But then like let's now just get it done and um so I, I'm I'm definitely a driver. Yeah. Okay, our next question is from Monica Rodriguez, and I, I think it, it connected to that humble um, criteria that you mentioned earlier. And the question is, how can I communicate effectively when there are cultural or language and language differences? So I can share my own experience because English is not my first language. Um, I grew up in Brazil and then I came to the United States to go to college and then I ended up staying. So it's been now more than 20 years that I've been here and I had to learn the hard way, I guess. Um, and I'd say that, you know, each organization that you work for is its own ecosystem and you have to learn the rules of engagement of that ecosystem. So pay attention to how people communicate. Um, for example, you know, being Latin, I used to talk a lot. And then I realized that especially the language of business is short and to the point. So at one point I, I told myself, okay, if you want to be more effective, if you want to be heard, you have to get to the point faster. So I took classes and I started again to pay attention to the people around me and uh, people who are in powerful decisions, they don't have a lot of time. So they have to get to the point right away. And if I want to get their attention, if I wanted them to understand my point of view or the project that we were working on, I had to get to the point. So I practiced, you know, so instead of saying, um, oh, I'm here today to talk to you about blah, 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 blah. You say, here's the agenda, 
Today we're going to cover three things, one, two, and three. And at the end of this meeting, I'd like to come up or I'd like us to have a decision on X. And then people pay attention because they're like, wow, this person is direct. This person is not wasting my time. And um, they feel like you're being respectful, you're being professional, you're competent. So that would be my advice to you. And the other thing is on yourself, it's okay. I actually feel like that the workplace is changing and um, it's becoming more inclusive of people with different styles, different perspectives, different backgrounds. But um, again, pay attention to the ecosystem you're in and how people talk and who are the people who are the most successful there. There are things that they do, certain traits that are valued in that company. And if you are able to acquire those traits and practice those traits, then you're going to be heard and you're going to be more impactful. Yeah, I would add a couple more things. So practice, right? The more you uh, challenge yourself to say, I'm going to contribute in this meeting. And the more you do it, the, the safer and better you're going to feel about your style, how you communicate. So practice in different settings. And then also just writing down. So let's say you, you challenge yourself, I'm gonna ask a question in this meeting, write it down and then say it. You know, writing things down really helps clarify, makes you have a more concise and compelling um, answer, you know, question and answer. Um, it's okay to, to help yourself in, in situations that are difficult. Yes, and you know, to add to that, um, the same woman who pulled me aside to give me tips for the interview, she also pulled me aside another time and she said, you're so quiet in meetings. And I know you have done all this research, you're, you're always prepared, you never miss a deadline, the quality of your work is really good, but you don't talk in meetings. And I told her like, oh, I'm so intimidated because people here are much older than I am and they seem to know so much more than I do. And uh, she told me exactly what Consuelo said um, for me to come to the meetings with maybe three points that I wanted to make. And you know, you review the agenda, you understand what the meeting is about. And then the other thing that she told me was for me to talk in the first five minutes. And I had to really push myself because it's a little bit comfortable, let's, let's be honest. If you just sit there, you're a quiet listener, there's very little risk, right? So I had to really push myself and, and even things like, oh, hi everyone, how are you? And sitting down, because I would just come in and sit down and not say anything or just smile, but you know, be very quiet. Um, and that also really helped and then, you know, the seven steps that we reviewed together about making it safe. It's one way for you to make it safe for yourself that it's okay for you to talk in the beginning. And you also set the example for other people. I mean, there are gonna be other junior people in those meetings too. And they will feel like, oh, if so-and-so spoke, it's okay for me to speak too. Great, Think any other questions? Yes, we actually have one from one of our new board members, Will Davis. He's asking, can you speak to any strengths your Latinx heritage gave you in resolving conflict in complex teams? Especially interested in how to navigate gender bias conflict in STEM professional environments. Oh my goodness. Okay. <laughs> I'll go first because I'm not in HR. So <laughs> I can speak more freely. <laughs> um, okay, so let me see if I understand. The question is how my heritage helped me in uh, conflict types of situations at work and more specifically in terms of gender bias? Yes. Exactly. Okay. So I actually think that Latinx people, we are very good when it comes to dealing with conflict because at least from, my, from what I can tell based on my background and a lot of my friends, um, we are very good at thinking about the community. Like the happiness of the community comes first and then comes your happiness. So I think because of that, I'm very good at like making people feel safe, 
getting them to talk. And sometimes these conversations have to happen not in a big meeting with everybody where emotions are high and stakes are high, but having a chance to have coffee with somebody or just spending 15 minutes with them and say, hey, before we go into this meeting, I just wanted to hear your perspective on X, Y, and Z. And um, so I think that is a huge advantage that we have. And I've noticed that throughout my career, I'm the person they choose to do with all the difficult people or the difficult situations. And for a while, I kept asking myself, why me? And then later realized, oh, because I'm good at it. So, so I think like we should own it um, and, and just know that this is something that we just naturally and intuitively we have. And maybe it just comes more easily to us because of the way we were raised. Um, I never thought too much about it until I realized that I am like, I know everybody on my team. I know all of them by name. I can call in a favor right away because you're able to build those relationships and you're able to um, be respectful and open. In terms of gender bias at work. So um, I have to say, in the earlier years of my career, I never felt any sort of gender bias because I work for a public relations agencies in San Francisco that were owned by women, and there were a lot of women in, in those firms. So when I hear those things that people are talking about, the Me Too movement and this, this, and that, I really didn't experience any of this. But once you go and you work for like bigger companies, tech companies where mostly men and very few women. I, I remember for the first time I was like, oh, wow. And I'm the only woman of color in this meeting. And I'm the only woman with an accent in this meeting. So I remember having those moments when I realized like, oh, this is different. I used to be in meetings where we had, I don't know, five, 10 women and maybe one or two men in the meeting. Um, so I think it goes back, I, I don't know if I ever felt like when you're talking about in terms of gender bias, um, but it was more like I had to learn the language of that ecosystem, you know, and, and at Microsoft, there were so many strong women who were senior directors, general managers, vice presidents, but I felt like I naturally gravitated towards them. And um, I would just observe them and how they would navigate difficult conversations, how they would lead their teams. And then I would just like copy them. I was like, okay, um, this person does this really well, I'm gonna do it too. Or that person does this really well, I'm gonna meet with her for coffee and ask questions and try to learn a little bit more from them. So I felt like I've always had really strong uh, mentors one thing that I will say in terms of uh, gender bias, I felt I was interrupted a lot um, and I'd be speaking and people would just cut me off or sometimes I would say something and they wouldn't hear what I said and then somebody else would say it and they heard like exactly the same thing that I said. They wouldn't heard from me, but they would hear from somebody else. So one tactic that um, I came up with with some of my colleagues that um, at this place, let's keep it anonymous, um, was to um, amplify each other. So before meetings, we would just do a little powwow and I would say like, hey, I want to talk about this and I, I feel like this is a really important topic we should cover. And then we would go to the meetings and um, I would make my point and then it was not heard. And then one of my colleagues would say, as Erica said, um, this, 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 and this, or Erica made this really great point. And I would do the same for them. And that seemed to work really well because all of a sudden you felt heard and people couldn't really ignore what you said in me. So I'll add, um, so how has my Latinx culture helped me be an effective team player? Um, again, uh, as uh, Erica said, we actually tend to avoid conflict. So we like to make people happy. So we tend to be really good at playing that friend, 
um, and that mediator a role. Um, we also are very uh, responsible and hardworking. So we, you know, we want to keep on task and say, okay, we're, we don't have a lot of time. Let's get focused. Um, I've noticed that and we're adaptable, we're multicultural. So we do have that good people sense. We kind of sense the tension and the drama potentially that's happening. So we kind of see the landmines or where to be careful. Um, now, I don't know that my culture has specifically helped me um, navigate gender bias. I think in that situation, I really had to be actually a little bit more assertive. Right, because I think sometimes when when people see a Latina, they might make assumptions about we we are either too assertive or we're too do docile. So um, you just have to be yourself, and and that's why, like Eric says, it's so important that you have your voice heard very early on in any team. So you are comfortable with who you are and how you can contribute and have an impact. And I'm faced with, you know, gender bias and I am responsible to make sure that that doesn't happen in the work. It's a constant uh, work that we need to work uh, at, at in our teams in the workplace. Okay. Thank you, ladies. I'm going to thank all of our participants. Thank for you so all much. For the additional questions that they sent in. Well, there you go, Chef Familia. Please join me in thanking Consuelo and Erica. Bravo. Un mil gracias. Excellent tips for our members. Great. Yeah, thank you so much. Anytime. Okay, so Chef Familia, please remember to take our survey. You'll receive a thank you email with the survey link after this webinar. We need your constructive feedback to make this program the best it can be. We hope to see you on July 24th for webinar number seven, Change the World with Your Innovative Ideas. Come join us to discover ways to cultivate your courage to take action and to strengthen the innovator within you. I'm excited to share that we've added the videos to ship.org. So please find those recorded webinars there. And signing off from Ship National, buenas noches, Ship Familia. Buenas noches. Bye.